Robin Hood, The History and Folklore of the English Legend Written by Charles River Editors Narrated by Jack Chikijan Introduction Robin Hood There are few characters in the English language more iconic than Robin Hood. Emerging out of the ballads of the High Middle Ages and surviving through numerous permutations to the present day, the green-clad archer has become an icon. Today he represents a playful, irreverent, and cunning resistance to corruption and injustice, associated primarily with stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Robin Hood's selfless acts of helping the masses at the expense of himself by not keeping his treasure have led to contemporary figures like Bill Gates being called modern-day Robin Hoods, and when a British man robbed a bank in 2013 and handed out the money to homeless people before he was arrested and imprisoned, the name Robin Hood was naturally in the news once more. Robin Hood is a celebrated folk hero and a kind of good thief, but the earliest stories about Robin Hood depict a far different character. The first Robin Hood was often a brutal and selfish, yet also honorable figure, an anti-hero, loved, perhaps paradoxically, by many social classes and loathed by authorities. When the notorious gunpowder plot was discovered at the beginning of the 17th century, the Earl of Salisbury condemned Guy Fawkes and the conspirators for being Robin Hoods. The transformation of Robin Hood over the centuries has left many scholars attempting to find the origins behind the original story. Like King Arthur, some have even sought a historical figure that might serve as the basis for Robin Hood, while others have sought out mythological origins to see if Robin Hood's character evolved out of a mythological figure. When looking for the historical and mythical figure, scholars try to understand how the Robin Hood of these tales came to be. What are the origins of Robin Hood, and what can they tell people about the past? What is the historical basis for Robin Hood, if any? Chapter 1 The Historical Setting for Robin Hood The stories of Robin Hood are set in a period known as the High Middle Ages, or the Gothic Era, which stretches through the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. In England, this period conveniently begins with the Norman invasion led by William the Conqueror in 1066, and it is widely viewed as ending with the beginning of the Hundred Years' War in 1337. The period was dominated by the feudal system, and though there were powerful kings during this era, their power was often checked by the strength of the nobility, such as in the First Barons' War in the time of John I, from 1215 to 1217. The strong central states that defined the reigns of the Tudors would not emerge for several more centuries. There were other powerful social forces during that era. Perhaps the most prominent was the Catholic Church, which had not yet been divided by the Reformation or by King Henry VIII's establishment of the Church of England. Monasteries were places of great importance and wealth. At the same time, there were many autonomous royal towns that served as great draws for the rural population. In fact, the increased sickness in the towns meant that without contiguous migration from the rural areas, they would not have been able to replace their own population, much less grow in size. While this system was common across much of Western Europe, especially France, in Britain it was complicated by the fact that it was a social system overlaid on an older Saxon system after the Norman conquest. The Normans brought with them a number of technological, social, and military innovations, and among the most important were the mounted knight and sophisticated stone castles. Together, these innovations not only conquered the Saxons, but eventually the Welsh, Scots, and much of Ireland as well. After the initial conquests, when the Normans faced other Normans and French speakers, the style of war changed. Commanders in these wars tended not to prefer open battles or elaborate sieges, despite their popularity in literature, but instead opted for wars of attrition, primarily fought by raiding parties, sent out to devastate the agricultural production of enemies. Inevitably, 
the peasants suffered the most in these conflicts. This style of conflict was due to the fact that armored knights were expensive to maintain and difficult to train, as well as being difficult to defeat. A squadron of knights could only be defeated by a similar body, meaning that open warfare threatened the entire military superstructure of a region for a generation. Moreover, castles were incredibly difficult to penetrate, so the peasantry seemed an easier target for warfare. After the Norman conquest, the Saxon nobility was largely deposed, which left a divide between Norman nobles on the one hand and Saxon peasants on the other. The Saxons lacked the technology to defeat the Normans, and their resistance against their new masters began to take the form of what would today be considered guerrilla warfare. Their goal was not necessarily to drive out the enemy, but simply to plunder. Despite modern fantasies of Robin Hood raiding the castle of the Sheriff of Nottingham, this banditry took place outside of these strongholds, and largely within the wild places, especially the royal forests. The forests were areas of protected wilderness, reserved for royal hunting parties, and within which poaching was a punishable offense. Thus, forest was a legal term, marking not simply any stand of timber, but one protected by the king's agents the warders and rangers. Sherwood Forest was first created in 958 A.D. by local nobility and was seized by the royal family after 1066. Kings had lodges within the forest, and the ruins of King John's can still be seen there today. In the 13th century, the period in which most Robin Hood stories take place, Sherwood covered over 100,000 acres and through the heart of it ran the Great North Way, a road that ran from London to York. This was not unbroken forest, but instead a mixed-use area, dotted with charcoal burners, monastic establishments, which Robin often deals with, and small communities. It was an ideal region for bandits living outside the law. Archery features prominently in the stories of Robin Hood mostly because the English longbow was a crucially important weapon in that era, even beyond the archery tournaments that the Nottingham nobility were so fond of. The longbow has a deep tradition in England that dates back to the depths of prehistory, but it came to international prominence in the 1340s, when the Hundred Years' War began. By 1363, all Englishmen were ordered by law to practice archery on Sundays and holidays, which led to spectacular success at the battles of Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt, where English commoner archers cut down the French noble knights, forever changing the balance of power in medieval warfare. Through these victories, the ideal of the English yeoman archer as a common but free man defending his king entered mythology. Combined with the Robin Hood tradition of poaching and banditry, it becomes apparent how stories of Robin Hood serve as a symbol of the strength of Saxon commoners to overcome their oppressors and reverse the balance of power, even if for only a moment. It has been common to view the High Middle Ages as the age of chivalry and the golden age of the monastic scholasticism, but this is largely a view provided by several centuries of hindsight. It is true that the High Middle Ages were a period of relative prosperity compared to the late Middle Ages, which witnessed the Black Death and horrific internecine wars that decimated the European population. But the survival of the Robin Hood legend paints a different picture. Unlike the tales of King Arthur or Charlemagne, which view this period from the perspective of the nobility, the Robin Hood stories are a precious survival of peasant tales. They paint an image of the common folk being ground under the heel of taxes to the king and tithes to the church, of official corruption and of arbitrary and cruel punishments, especially for poaching on royal lands. Certainly, the time described was not one of harmony, but the internal strife that would open the arteries of Europe in the late Middle Ages already devastated the countryside. In particular, Britain suffered during a period known as the Anarchy, a civil war that ran from 1135 to 1153 and was vividly portrayed in Ken Follett's popular novel, The Pillars of the Earth, published in 1989. 
Out of this emerged widespread banditry amongst the lower classes, of which the Robin Hood stories are one manifestation, and royal agents, like the sheriff, attempted to maintain order. Outside of the king's personal dominions, the agent of his will was an official known as the sheriff. The Norman kings in the era of Richard, John, and their predecessors appointed sheriffs from among their closest allies to serve as the able administrators of their more distant territories. These early sheriffs were more akin to viceroys and were given considerable autonomous power, but during the reigns of Henry III and Edward I, the role became more bureaucratized and given less to intimates and more to loyal bureaucrats. As the role shifted, sheriffs were appointed to every county in the kingdoms and were required to provide revenues to the crown and manage property as stewards. The sheriff of Nottingham was a real position, which even today still continues to exist as a ceremonial post. The setting for the Robin Hood stories takes place over both periods of time, allowing for the sheriff of Nottingham to be depicted both as a royal agent and as an inept and corrupt civil servant. Though he would be a more intimidating enemy as a royal ally, he would have been the scourge of outlaws either way. Chapter 2 In Search of a Historical Robin Hood It's clear that Robin Hood served as an effective symbol for certain people during the High Middle Ages. But the most popular question that pops up when examining the history of Robin Hood was whether the famed villain ever actually lived. Like most folk legends that date back hundreds of years, there are some hints, but no firm answers. Most versions of the Robin Hood story today have his tale set during the reigns of Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, as well as his brother John, who served in Richard's stead during the Third Crusade and became king after his death. Richard reigned from 1189 to 1199, and John reigned from 1199 to 1216, putting the potential setting for the Robin Hood adventures at 24 years. Most of the Robin Hood stories are more specific, setting the adventures during Richard's captivity from 1192 to 1194, but by tracing the historical roots of the Robin Hood stories, it becomes clear almost immediately that these dates are a relatively recent addition to the story and that tales of the rogue potentially predate the reign of Richard I and continue long after it. The original Robin Hood stories were folk tales that moved amongst the common people, branding him as an anti-hero who challenged the vested authority of king and church and got away with it. He was not, however, the jolly swashbuckler that most people think of today. One modern writer likened him to a medieval godfather, a man who was not afraid of brutally effective violence, but was governed by his own code of honor. This characterization comes from some of the earliest surviving depictions, such as the early ballads, that have much the miller's son murdering the page of a monk in order to protect their hiding place. That is clearly out of step with the depiction of much the miller's son being one of the merry men and hardly anything like the thigh-slapping jolly woodsman of the Errol Flynn films. The question thus remains, was there a real Robin Hood that ultimately served as the foundation for the stories? This question is muddled by the fact that many later brigands adopted the title Robin Hood or Little John as criminal pseudonyms, the same way that mobsters take names like Pretty Boy Floyd, Ice Pick Willie, and Mad Dog. The name serves both to hide their real identities and also to increase their notoriety. Further complicating the search for the original Robin is the fact that the nobility of medieval England would use the title Robin Hood to describe all sorts of miscreants, including one of England's most notorious criminals, Guy Fawkes. While Guy Fawkes himself has become a sort of anti-hero symbol over four hundred years after his treasonous plot, he was hardly thought of that way when the label Robin Hood was being bandied about to describe him in the wake of the gunpowder plot. That said, there are a few tantalizing hints that an actual historical figure served as the basis for the Robin Hood legend. 
scholars have found reference to a fugitive named William Robehod, or William, son of Robert La Fave, in 1261 and 1262, and this fugitive led a gang of outlaws. According to the records, however, the wealth that was stolen in this case belonged to Robehod himself. His property was seized in his absence. It is probable that William, son of Robert Lefebvre's name, was changed by court clerks to Robehod, making this the earliest datable reference to a name that seems awfully similar to Robin Hood. Similarly, records from the 1260s to 1300 make reference to several men named Rabinhod across England, as far north as York and as far south as Berkshire which suggests that multiple outlaws were using similar monikers. It's possible but unlikely that William, son of Robert Lefebvre, actually had the last name Robehod, and that he was so notorious that other outlaws mimicked his name. But if it is assumed that Robehod was not his actual name, this means that stories about a figure named Robehod were so prevalent by 1261 that the court clerks who deemed him Robehod in the records were aware of these stories and were likening William, son of Robert Lefebvre, to the Robehod figure. Today, scholars think there's an even more likely candidate for the Robin Hood legend, and this man existed at least a generation earlier, which makes it possible he set the stage for the people known as Robehod and Rabin Hod from 1260 to 1300. There was a man named Robert Hodd, who apparently joined John's failed 1193-94 coup against his brother Richard the Lionheart, and whose property was seized in 1225. Given the era in which Robert Hodd lived, and the story of his life, it's possible that Robert Hodd was a well-known enough historical figure for outlaws and lawmen alike to reference. Robin Hood is often depicted as a supporter of Richard the Lionheart, as an outlaw who harries King John and his corrupt officers, so the fact that Robert Hodd fought for John seems out of step with the legend. However, most scholars pinpoint the notion that Robin Hood supported Richard the Lionheart as being a 16th century creation that does not match the earlier stories about Robin Hood, such as the 15th century ballads in A Jest of Robin Hood, which claim Robin Hood existed during the reign of King Edward. One other contender that has gotten some traction in recent years is a man named Roger Godbird, who led a band of highwaymen during the 13th century. As per lore, Godbird was held by the sheriff at Nottingham Castle, and he plundered the wealthy on the Great North Road. His exact birth and death are not known, but he is believed to have lived between the 1230s and the 1290s. Some 15th century chroniclers make mention of Robin Hood in a way that suggests they were speaking of a historical figure. For example, Walter Bower wrote in the mid-15th century, Then, circa 1266, arose the famous murderer, Robert Hood, as well as Little John, together with their accomplices from among the disinherited, whom the foolish populace are so inordinately fond of celebrating, both in tragedies and comedies and about whom they are delighted to hear the jesters and minstrels sing above all other ballads. Similarly, a monk wrote in the mid-fifteenth century, Around this time, according to popular opinion, a certain outlaw named Robin Hood, with his accomplices, infested Sherwood and other law-abiding areas of England, with continuous robberies. But at the same time, Bower's story includes anecdotes that sound more like the typical Robin Hood tales. At one point, Robin Hood refuses to retreat until after he hears mass, and Bower credits his subsequent victory over his enemies to his religious devotion. In addition to the search for a historical figure, oral legends have also ensured that certain actual places have become associated with Robin Hood. For example, Legend claims that Robin's grave exists in the ruined Priory of Kirklees and is dated to 1247. This spot is said to be where Robin, poisoned by the treachery of the Prioress, fired his arrow and asked Little John to bury me where my arrow falls. Today there is a stone grave in Kirklees, 
a nineteenth-century replacement of the lost original, said to be Robin Hood's, that lies far from the ruined priory and beyond the range of arrows of the time. Interestingly, it is exactly twice the distance of Robin's famous shot mentioned in the ballad of Robin Hood and the Guy of Gisborne. It seems the tradition that associates Robin Hood with that grave dates back to about the seventeenth century, as referenced by Thomas Gale, Dean of York, who wrote, Robin Hood's death is stated by Ritson to have taken place on the 18th of November, 1247, about the 87th year of his age. But according to the following inscription found among the papers of the Dean of York, the death occurred a month later. In this inscription, which bears evidence of high antiquity, Robin Hood is described as Earl of Huntington, his claim to which title has been as hotly contested as any disputed peerage upon record. Here, underneath this little stone, lies Robert, Earl of Huntington, never archer there as he so good, and people called him Robin Hood. Such outlaws as him and his men will England never see again. However, as with Bower's seemingly historical account of Robin Hood, Gale's writing also suggests a familiarity with the literary tales of Robin Hood and the notion that Robin Hood is more of a representative symbol than a historical figure. The suggestion that Robin Hood was actually the Earl of Huntington likely came from Anthony Munday's plays around the end of the 16th century, which thus far are the earliest known references to Robin Hood being the Earl of Huntington. There are a few other locations that also have a long-term association with Robin Hood, the best known of which are the Major Oak and Robin Hood's Well. The Major Oak is Britain's largest oak and sits at the heart of today's Sherwood Forest Park. Though it is debatable whether the tree is even old enough to have seen a historic robin, it is forever etched into lore as his forest throne. The well has a more modern stone pavilion built over it, but it has sat on the side of the Great North Road, where Robin is said to have done his plundering for centuries. It is said that Robin and his band would drink from the waters and that Robin married Marion at that site. Recently, some neo-pagans and folklore enthusiasts have drawn connections between Robin Hood and the trickster fairy Robin Goodfellow, which one enthusiast lays out, saying, Both had a penchant for giving travelers a hard time. Puck was a shapeshifter, and Robin Hood a master of disguise. And Gillian Edwards notes that the Goodfellow in Robin Goodfellow's name could mean a boon companion or thief. Since the Robin Goodfellow ballads appear later than the Robin Hood ones, it's possible that the fairy may have taken his name from the outlaw, not the other way around. Both Robin Goodfellow and Robin Hood appear in the English ballad tradition, are associated with the forest, and have a connection to Midsummer, Robin Goodfellow primarily through Shakespeare, and Robin Hood through the medieval plays. There do seem to be important parallels, but it is important to note that Robin Hood's trickster personality is a recent innovation, so he does not actually share that with Goodfellow. In addition to the potential connection to Goodfellow, others have made even more tenuous connections between Robin Hood and old Celtic gods of the forest, especially the Green Man and Hearn the Hunter. Ultimately, any potential mythological roots for Robin Hood remain tantalizing but unreachable. While many find these interpretations convincing, academic scholars have yet to find enough connections to believe they warrant serious scholarship. Chapter 3. The Literary Origins of Robin Hood While the search for a historical figure and archaeological sites associated with Robin Hood continues, it is far easier to trace the literary origins of Robin Hood. Medieval ballads and plays are what made Robin Hood famous and are a rich source of folklore. In many ways, the literature provides as much historical context as the historical records, because folklore like this bears the imprint of the social context in which it was developed and performed. A number of early ballads about Robin Hood survived, including Robin Hood and the Monk, Robin Hood and the Potter, Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham, a jest of Robin Hood, and Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne. 
These works date as far back as the Middle Ages themselves. The early ballads include examples of both serious and comic songs, and, though he does make a generous loan in one of the ballads, none of them depict Robin robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. While they are set in Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire, these songs carried the Robin legend to the far ends of Britain, and naturally they served as a foundation for subsequent ballads and folk tales to be developed on top of them. As recently as the 19th century, British ballad collectors were using these surviving ballads to establish dozens of new modern tales about Robin Hood themselves. One of the most important early associations of Robin Hood, the one where he first became connected to Maid Marian, was in the medieval celebration of May Day. This ancient holiday takes place on the 1st of May and is a celebration of spring. Its more tame manifestations, most notably the Maypole and Morris dancing, were revived by nostalgic Victorians, but the medieval celebrations that featured Robin and Marion were far from tame. On the contrary, they were raucous, bawdy, and unruly affairs, and some elements of this tradition survive in the outlying corners of Britain. One of the most famous is the apparently ancient masked dance of the Abios in the Cornish village of Padstow, where male dancers swirl through the streets, attempt to capture women in their wide hoop skirts, and even enact masked judgment on disliked local figures. Scholars have examined these festivals as an example of the first carnivalesque, a period of officially sanctioned transgression when the social order is inverted. Up becomes down, beggar becomes king, man becomes pig, pig becomes man. In this context of social transgression, the stories of Robin Hood as a commoner who robs nobles were immensely popular, and the early ballads were transformed into plays. It was here that the character of Maid Marian was introduced as a counterpart to Robin. It is also probable that this was where the association with green clothing appeared. May Day celebrations often involve greenery and green clothes. Even the nobility sometimes got involved in the act. Henry VIII was said to have entered his queen's chambers with eleven noblemen all dressed in green, as Robin Hood and his outlaw band. Robin is at the center of all the tales, even the earliest ones. But the early tales do not actually tell the story of how he came to be an outlaw, even though they do mark him as a yeoman. An old term, yeoman refers to both a free farmer living on his own land and a free servant, or soldier, serving a lord. They were not serfs, peasants, or bound laborers, but they were free men who still had to do physical labor, meaning that they were below the gentry. Early Robin Hood was not unshakably connected to Sherwood either. A number of the early tales link him to Barnsdale Forest, located not in Nottinghamshire, but further north in Yorkshire. The Robin Hood of the earliest tales does not give to the poor, but the seeds were sown for future stories that incorporate that theme. In the longest of the early tales, The Jest, he loans money to the poor knight Sir Richard at the Lee, and also lays out a code of conduct for his men, which demonstrates that Robin Hood and his followers were different than the brutal ruffians that travelers feared. However, the early tales of Robin Hood depict a remarkably malleable character. In one story, he could be selfish or serious, and in the next he might be selfless or humorous. He is frequently insulting his friends and scornful of the church, but he is devoted to the Virgin Mary. His actions towards Guy of Gisborne, including the mutilation of his corpse in Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, reveal an early character that is often brutal and unlikable, a far cry from the lovable rogue so common in late 19th and early 20th century tales. In today's stories, Marion often plays second fiddle to Robin and is depicted like a Victorian lady pining away for her heroic swashbuckling man. However, Marion actually appears to predate Robin by many years. She was the queen of the May Day celebrations, and as a symbol of the New Year, she was a virgin. This is the origin of the title Maid, which was not a female servant, but a shortened version of Maiden. The word itself appears first in English in the late 12th century, 
the same period in which the Robin stories are typically set. Marion does not appear in the oldest ballads, which do not have a romantic element, and are instead focused on Robin's involvement in illegal escapades in the Greenwood or the town of Nottingham, usually with Little John. Marion definitely existed at that time, and plenty of people would have been familiar with her, but she was an independent piece of folklore connected to the Queen or Lady of May. When Robin was introduced to the May Day celebrations, there was originally a choice between a Robin play and a Marion play. It was only later that the two were merged, and naturally Marion became Robin Hood's love interest. While Friar Tuck does not appear in the earliest stories, he is undoubtedly one of the earliest characters, and has taken a number of forms, of which the famous fat and lazy friar is only one. The depiction of Tuck as a fat and lazy friar has been dominant since Howard Pyle's nineteenth-century book. Tuck first appears not in the ballads, but in the Tudor May Day plays, in a way slightly before but similar to the fusion of Marion into the stories. It was only later that he moved over into the ballad tradition. In fact, it is possible he's connected to the friar character in traditional Morris dancing. One clue that makes clear Friar Tuck's ill fit with the Robin Hood tales is the fact that friars did not exist in the era of Richard the Lionheart and his brother John. The term friar refers to a member of the mendicant order, meaning that neither the monk nor the monastic organization owned property, and that unlike cloistered orders, who separated themselves from the world, the friars worked directly amongst the populace. Prominent mendicants included the Dominicans and Franciscans, but the first of these orders, the Dominicans, was only founded in the year of King John's death, and did not arrive in England for over a decade. Nevertheless, although his specific order occasionally changes within the stories, Tuck is always a friar, unlike many characters in the tales, who have had their backstories change. The Merry Men were not an identifiable group for centuries, but that does not mean Robin Hood was unaccompanied in the early ballads. Indeed, the early tales are centered around the relationships between Robin and his fellow outlaws, as opposed to more modern retellings that focus upon Robin's search for justice, for himself and others, his quest for the hand of Marion, or his defense of the legitimate king. The earliest, longest-lasting, and most important companion of Robin is Little John, whose name appeared not only in the ballads, but was also adopted by historical thieves as a moniker like Robin Hood itself. Little John is, however, something of a cipher, he is known for his great size and strength, which serve as the basis for his ironic nickname, but little else. Any backstory before meeting Robin is a relatively new development, because the early ballads depict Robin and John originally being fast friends and criminal partners. The other two members of the criminal band from this period are Much, or Midge, the miller's son, and Will Scarlet, or Stutely. These two characters are named and take actions within the storylines, but at no point are they truly fleshed out. The most readers learn about Much, the miller's son, is that he is the son of a miller, and that he was outlawed for poaching the king's deer, an offense punishable by death. He kills a page in Robin Hood and the Monk, a scene that would never need to worry about making its way into a Disney retelling. Will Scarlet is also present in the early ballads and may be the same character as Will Stutely. He only gains a backstory and characteristic elements in the rather late ballad Robin Hood and the Newly Arrived, in which he's depicted as a wealthy young man dressed in red, who Robin encounters, recruits, because he's Robin's nephew, and grants a new name to, presumably to disguise him. These two stories, Much Hunting Deer and Will Dressed in Red, have become the widely accepted versions of the tales. Other characters from the criminal band in the early ballads include David of Doncaster, Arthur a Bland, and Gilbert Whitehand, but these individuals are simply named. They have no distinguishing marks and take no distinctive actions in the stories. There are three villainous characters that appear in the earliest tales, the Sheriff of Nottingham, the Bishop of Hereford, and Guy of Gisborne. 
The sheriff represents corrupt secular power, the bishop represents corrupt church power, and Guy is a brutal representative of the more traditional and typical outlaw. Of course, Robin's greatest and most notorious enemy in the early ballads is the sheriff of Nottingham. In fact, Prince John would only be tacked on as a villain much later, when Robin came to be associated with loyalty to the rightful monarch, Richard the Lionheart, John's brother. While the events in the tales often take place outside of Nottingham, this is not necessarily an anachronism. Because the full title for the position of Sheriff of Nottingham at the time was High Sheriff of Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, and the Royal Forests, a position that existed from 1068 to 1568. The sheriff, especially in the early tales, has no personal name and is frequently killed by Robin Hood. As the lack of a name suggests, he serves as a general foil for the protagonist and a representative of the corrupt system that Robin steals from, so he has no distinct personality. Only in Robin and the Sheriff of Nottingham and Robin and Guy of Gisborne is the title Sheriff of Nottingham specifically named. In other titles, he is referred to only as the Sheriff. It was only in later versions that he actually demonstrates personality traits, usually cowardice. In the ballad Robin Hood and the Bishop of Hereford, Robin plunders the traveling Bishop of Hereford. The bishop represents corrupt church officials in general, but there was a historical bishop that he's based on. Hereford is a city in western England, near the border with Wales, and is the capital of Herefordshire. It was granted a town charter in 1189 by Richard the Lionheart as Hereford in Wales, but the place was much older than that, and the seat of the bishop goes back to 676 A.D. During the era of the Robin Hood stories, it was obviously a place of some wealth, due not only to its recent recognition as a royal town, but also due to the importance and massive size of the city's Hereford Castle, a bulwark in the wars against the Welsh, which had been rebuilt after seeing considerable action in the anarchy. Thus, for the tale-tellers in Yorkshire and Nottingham of that period, the Bishop of Hereford was a suitably distant but presumably corrupt priest from a well-known and wealthy settlement. Guy of Gisborne, who was occasionally called Sir Guy in some of the stories, was originally a yeoman, like Robin, who the Sheriff of Nottingham charges with hunting Robin down. However, the earliest surviving tale, Robin and the Guy of Gisborne, is set in Yorkshire, outside the Sheriff's jurisdiction. This suggests that it is probable that there were parallel traditions of Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire tales that were eventually amalgamated together into one. Guy is an intimidating figure who dresses in a full horse's hide, a completely unusual outfit for the time, and he stalks Robin in the forest. Robin and the Guy of Gisborne is a much darker Robin tale than readers are accustomed to today. In the tale, little John has been kidnapped and is being held by the sheriff and Guy. Eventually, Robin tricks Guy as to his identity, kills him, and cuts off his head. Disguised in Guy's robe, he disfigures Guy's face to make it unrecognizable, and then comes into the sheriff's camp, where he frees little John and kills the sheriff with an arrow through the heart. Chapter 4 Transformation into a Good and Noble Outlaw As Robin Hood's tales and songs were retold in the seventeenth century, a curious thing happened. The outlaw, who had always been a Saxon yeoman, became ennobled. This was not only a literal ennoblement. He was said to have been the descendant of an ancient Saxon house, but also a metaphorical one. In this era, Robin came to represent all the values that the gentry saw in itself, hospitality, generosity, courteousness, Christianity, and loyalty to the crown. The seventeenth century was the era of the Stuarts, but it came directly upon the heels of the Tudor reign in Britain. The dynasty of such famed rulers as Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. The captivation with Robin in the seventeenth century was a direct inheritance of the Tudors, who were fascinated with folklore that included not only Robin, but also King Arthur. 
the Tudors went as far as tailoring the legend of King Arthur to bolster their own legitimacy. The fact that the Tudors depicted themselves not as Normans, but Welsh, may have made the ethnic strife implicit in the tales less subversive. One major inheritance of the Tudor period was giving a name and a noble title to Robin which was perhaps the most significant change to the character's backstory that has ever occurred. After the Tudor period, it was widely believed that Robin Hood was, in fact, Robert Earl of Huntington, that he was the lost son of John, the last Earl, and that he lived from 1160 to 1247. Thus, Robin Hood transformed from a low-born free man into the Earl of Huntington. The earldom of Huntington was created in 1065 and given to a Saxon family, which kept the title after the Norman conquest. That family intermarried with the royal house of Scotland, and it was the death of the queen and countess of Huntington, Maud, that precipitated the devastating civil war known as the Anarchy. The line became extinct in 1237 after the death of the last heir, and the title lapsed as a result but it was revived under a different family during the reign of the Tudors. As noted before, the association between Robin Hood and the Earl of Huntington was concretely made in two plays by Anthony Munday, a predecessor of Shakespeare. Those plays, The Downfall of Robert Earl of Huntington and The Death of Robert Earl of Huntington, in 1598 and 1601 respectively, came during the twilight of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the last of the Tudors. Monday broke strongly from earlier popular works and gentrified his hero, making him the victim of courtly betrayal and making his primary concerns not thievery but high politics and justice. By the time William Stukeley, who lived from 1687 to 1765, published his monumental Paleographica Britannica, in 1747, he was able to fabricate a family tree for Robin as Robert Fitzsooth, Earl of Huntington, and pass it off as legitimate history. This material change in origin also meant that Robin had to be given a more lofty motivation than simply material gain. In addition to the claim that he was illegitimately dispossessed and driven to the forest by the politics of a corrupt court, this was also the time when the concept that Robin robbed from the rich and gave to the poor first emerged. In the old ballads, Robin Hood never gave away any of his wealth. The closest he came was lending money to Richard at the Lee on favorable terms. Obviously, a yeoman handing out favorable loans is a far cry from a nobleman riding through peasant villages and tossing coins everywhere for the masses to have. Further evidence that the transformation of Robin Hood was a product of the times is the fact that the idea of a nobleman stealing from the rich and giving to the poor would have been ludicrous to the English people during the high Middle Ages. It was quite likely that a peasant bearing a gemstone, ring, or shirt, obviously belonging to or meant for a nobleman, would have been in terrible danger given the harsh court system of medieval England. As strange as it may seem to modern readers, the invention of the robbing the rich and giving to the poor tale actually came from the rich themselves. After all, nobody imagines themselves as a villain, and even the lower gentry could suffer mightily at the hands of corrupt bureaucrats and churchmen. The fact that Robin often directs his rapacious attentions towards a bloated Catholic church must also have rung true in the ears of the newly Protestant nobility many of whom had recently gained lands seized by Henry VIII from the monasteries during his break with the Catholic Church and his establishment of the Church of England. King Henry's theft from the Catholic Church was far greater than anything done by Robin. Even still, the 17th century provided a mixed picture regarding Robin Hood's generosity. In the ballad The Noble Fisherman, Robin gives away the value of a French ship he captures, including part of the value to a widow and part to found an almshouse. But in Robin Hood and Queen Catherine, the beneficiary of his aid is the Queen, and several tales speak of him robbing peddlers. In addition to a new backstory and a new motivation, 
The seventeenth century gave Robin Hood a new companion, the minstrel Alan a Dale. Alan a Dale's first surviving appearance is in the ballad Robin Hood and Alan a Dale, where Robin helps rescue Alan's love from an arranged marriage with an older man. Robin stops the bishop, and while wearing the bishop's robes, performs the marriage himself. Alan is a wandering minstrel, who quickly becomes a fixture within Robin lore even though he was only one of many characters introduced during this period. It is difficult to determine exactly why Alan stuck while others faded away. It's possible that a minstrel was an appealing addition for the real-life minstrels, who sang Robin's praises, or perhaps having a tale-teller served as a useful device for moving plot lines. Some recent retellings have even incorporated Alan as the narrator. Chapter 5. Robin Hood and the Modern Era Perhaps the most important work in the Robin Hood genre over the last two centuries is Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, first published in 1820. In the classic novel, Robin appears at Prince John's archery tournament wearing a Lincoln Green outfit and goads the prince into making a wager. Scott's Robin is a lover and master of disguises, courteous, generous and playful, taking as much pleasure in tricking his enemies as he does killing them. He's known not as a scoundrel, but as King Richard declares when Robin reveals his identity, King of Outlaws and Prince of Good Fellows. The respect is mutual, because Robin in this version is a true patriot who yearns throughout the story for the return of the true king. He's a patriot through and through, and when his men leap out in ambush, they invariably shout, St. George for Merry England. St. George is the patron saint of England, and a picture of chivalric nobility, who's typically depicted as a mounted and armored knight, who battles and vanquishes evil in the form of a dragon. Merry England is the type of England that this Robin embodies, a back-slapping, ale-drinking, song-singing place, where men are men, and women are largely absent. It's a concept that is crucial to understanding what Scott added to the Robin Hood story. Ivanhoe brought two crucial innovations to the Robin story. The first is that Scott changed Robin Hood's personality by reinventing him as a merry rogue. While previous depictions of Robin Hood took comic forms and had Robin Hood possessing a sense of humor, like when he invites Sir Richard at the Lee to dinner and then robs payment from him, the idea of a jolly thief king holding court over his merry men from a great oak tree throne deep in the forest was Sir Walter Scott's innovation. Robin's backstory also became more fixed at this point. He's named as a Saxon yeoman by the name of Robin of Locksley, L-O-C-K or L-O-X. The conflict between Norman and Saxon becomes explicit in this tale which is also an important element in subsequent retellings. Moreover, since Ivanhoe is set during Richard's crusade and John's regency over the throne of England, the novel undoubtedly helped to cement Robin in that specific time period. Finally, Scott appears to have invented the story of Robin splitting his own arrow in the archery competition, a story which has since become a standard of Robin Hood lore. Scott describes the scene, writing, so saying, and without showing the least anxiety to pause upon his aim, Locksley stepped to the appointed station and shot his arrow as carelessly in appearance as if he had not even looked at the mark. He was speaking almost at the instant that the shaft left the bowstring, yet it alighted in the target two inches nearer to the white spot, which marked the center than that of Hubert. After Hubert makes a better shot, Robin Hood returns for a second try, and letting fly his arrow with a little more precaution than before, it lighted right upon that of his competitor, which it split to shivers. The people who stood around were so astonished at his wonderful dexterity that they could not even give vent to their surprise in their usual clamor. This must be the devil, and no man of flesh and blood, whispered the yeomen to each other. Such archery was never seen since a bow was first bent in Britain. Another element of the Robin Hood legend that came from Ivanhoe took longer to be fully integrated in the public consciousness. 
This was the backstory of Sir Wilfred of Ivanhoe himself. Ivanhoe was a Saxon knight at a time when they were rare, who was deeply loyal to King Richard the Lionheart, whom he had served with in the Crusades. He's dispossessed from his land and titles, and becomes not an outlaw, but a knight-errant, defending the honor of the rightful king. It would take a century, but eventually this backstory would become transposed from Ivanhoe, no longer a widely popular figure, to Robin Hood himself, when later tellers wanted to justify his revolt. Moreover, Sir Ivanhoe had, suitably for a knight in the imagined age of chivalry, an unattainable love interest in the form of Lady Rowena, his father's ward. Similar tales of Maid Marian, who's often depicted as the ward of either Prince John or the Sheriff of Nottingham, would later add further high-minded motivations for Robin. It should be no surprise that Ivanhoe, the first novel to deal with Robin Hood, came at the beginning of a time in which novels themselves were first emerging as a serious genre. Novels became popular for a number of reasons. First, they were a genre meant to be read by the growing audience of literate readers from the middle and lower classes, often as newspaper serials. Second, they were read in the vernacular languages, which helped to connect language to nationalism. Finally, in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, when Ivanhoe was written, and then in the era of industrial revolution that followed, there was massive interest throughout Europe in national folklore traditions and the protection and revival of the values of the rural regions. Sir Walter Scott's writings fit well within this time period and these currents. He was a prominent member of the Tory party, and Ivanhoe and his other writings, such as the novel Rob Roy, promoted the view of a noble pre-modern Britain. After Ivanhoe in 1820, many other Victorian British authors took up the story of Robin Hood. Their writings, which often worked off many of the ideas found in Ivanhoe, became instrumental in not only repopularizing Robin Hood, but also domesticating him to the point where he was primarily identified as a rope-swinging, swashbuckling, happy-go-lucky vigilante in green tights by the start of the twentieth century. One of the early romantic poems was W. B. Keats's Robin Hood to a Friend, written around 1818. In this rather short work, Keats mourns the passing of Robin's world. For instance, he writes, No, the bugle sounds no more, and the twanging bow no more. Silent is the ivory shrill, past the heath and up the hill. It is not Robin Hood that he mourns, per se, but the golden age of fraternity gallantry, and merry fun. This, of course, echoes the sentiments expressed in Ivanhoe, released to wider audiences two years later, where Robin Hood is the embodiment of light-hearted courage. However, as is often the case in Keats's work, Robin Hood is gripped with sadness. The ways of old are gone and will never return, while the modern world has become a dark age of modernity and industrialism. As Keats's poem puts it, Honor to the old bowstring, honor to the bugle horn, honor to the woods unshorn, honor to the Lincoln green, honor to the archer keen, honor to tight little John, and the horse he rode upon, honor to bold Robin Hood sleeping in the underwood, honor to Maid Marian and to all the Sherwood clan. As the Victorian age evolved, other poets and writers picked up where Keats and Scott left off, including Howard Pyle's important 1883 novel, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood of Great Renown in Nottinghamshire. Pyle, an accomplished artist, wove together various ballads and tales to create a coherent narrative in a form appropriate to children. His work was immediately popular and cemented Robin Hood as a do-gooder who gave away his profits and fought for England. Pyle, an American, would do similar projects with King Arthur, Aladdin, and Caribbean pirates, with his lush illustrations, establishing the stereotypes of pirate dress and Arthurian clothes that people think of today. Around the same time Pyle's book was published, Francis James Child published a collection titled English and Scottish Popular Ballads, which was released intermittently between 1882 and 1898. This collection, today called the Child Ballads, 
had 305 traditional songs, and 38 deal directly with Robin Hood. One additional ballad may be an early incarnation of the rogue, Robin and Gandalain. The child ballads had an effect upon Robin Hood, similar to that which the Grimm Brothers' collection of fairy tales had on that genre. The work made the tales easily accessible to a popular audience, made them available for recounting to children, and also served as an easy touchstone work for scholars. The collection, reworking, and popularization of folk tales were popular pursuits in 19th century Europe. In addition to the writings of Child and the Grimm brothers, scholars who did similar projects included the Kalevala tales in Finnish from 1835 and 36 by Elias Lonrot, the Romance of Tristan and Isolde from 1900 by Joseph Bedier in France, and the Mabinogion by Lady Charlotte Guest in Welsh from 1838 to 1849. In all of these cases, folk tales were collected and organized, and in some cases, especially the Kalevala and Tristan, were given a more cohesive, overarching narrative. This work was closely connected to the revival of nationalism throughout Europe at the time, as these tales were seen as embodiments of their tellers' national ethos and spirit. Similarly, by the end of the 19th century, the disparate Robin Hood tales were being fashioned into a single narrative which was increasingly aimed towards children. Robin Hood was already popular with children at that point, but the legend had not been entirely infantilized at that point. There were still serious adult works written about Robin Hood, too. Perhaps the most prominent came from Lord Tennyson, who produced the play The Foresters, Robin Hood and Maid Marian, in 1892, while he was the Poet Laureate of Britain. The play is set in Richard's England, and it follows the 16th century tradition by portraying Robin as the ousted Earl of Huntington. The evolution of Robin Hood into the symbol of the good outlaw can be seen in the 19th century's similar treatment of another thief. The Great North Road, where Robin Hood was said to have plundered, and where Robin Hood's well is located, was home to Britain's other great legendary thief, Dick Turpin. Turpin was a highwayman romanticized as a solitary figure, who sat on a great horse, brandished dual pistols, and wore a tri-corner hat, a great coat, and either a black bandana or a domino mask over his face. Turpin was certainly a historic figure, living from about 1705 to 1739, when he was hung for horse theft, and he's useful for understanding Robin Hood, because the two are remembered as the greatest thieves in British history and were romanticized in the songs of balladeers and poets in the 19th century. Both cut dashing, brave silhouettes, but unlike Robin Hood, Turpin was never transformed into an establishment figure. Turpin never fought for Merry England, the king, or anything other than himself. Instead, he was still remembered as a dangerous man who seized what he wanted from the king's road. In fact, 19th century Methodists in the west of England put up portraits of Turpin and John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, facing each other on their mantelpieces to remind them of the worst and best of humanity. Turpin is illustrative because the romanticization and memory of his story offer an example of how Robin Hood was likely remembered among the people of the high Middle Ages. Turpin's story is what Robin Hood's story very well might have been and or remained had it not been adopted by the gentry and transformed into a patriotic tale of the defense of king, country, and a fair maiden. The twentieth century has been a rich period for the Robin Hood story, thanks to the invention of new forms of media like films, television, comic books, and video games. While these stories certainly build upon the motifs and plots of earlier eras, they have also begun to move in new directions, including going back in time towards a grittier, more historically accurate portrayal. Even still, Robin Hood is usually depicted as being a noble on a quest for justice. One of the most formative portrayals of Robin Hood in cinema was Errol Flynn's The Adventures of Robin Hood from 1938, directed by Michael Curtiz and William Keithley. Filmed in Technicolor, it was the second highest grossing film of the year. In that film, Robin Hood was a true swashbuckler who swung from trees and chandeliers, fought a dramatic sword fight with Guy of Gisborne,
considered by some to be one of the best cinematic sword fights of all time, and was generally courteous, dashingly handsome, and roguishly clever. The Errol Flynn version of Robin Hood owed a great debt to Howard Pyle, whose imagery served as the basis for the costuming of the film, and was copied by others afterwards, including Disney and Mel Brooks. It was also Pyle who established the tales in a form suitable for children, which the 1938 film continued. The influence of Flynn can be felt on many subsequent depictions of Robin Hood, including Disney's animated version from 1973 and the spoof Robin Hood Men in Tights from 1993. Flynn's influence even made its way into the genre outside of Robin Hood specifically, as evidenced by non-Robin films like The Princess Bride from 1987. The Disney version was remarkable in that it fused the role of Robin with the French trickster Reynard the Fox, literally making Robin a fox, amongst other anthropomorphic animals. However, there has also been a backlash against tights and swashbuckling, and men in tights can be seen as part of this, since it thoroughly mocks the genre. More recent cinematic versions of Robin Hood have become increasingly gritty and dark. For instance, Russell Crowe's Robin Hood from 2010 attempts to create a realistic portrayal of what is essentially a guerrilla warrior. Sean Connery's Robin and Marion from 1976 does not necessarily reject swashbuckling, but it does show Robin as an old man, unable to swing from chandeliers. Kevin Costner's blockbuster Robin Hood Prince of Thieves from 1991 was the biggest budget recreation of Robin Hood yet, and though it had mixed reviews from the critics, it was a success at the box office. Prince of Thieves was a turn towards the grittier, more realistic version of the story, no swinging from trees, and it also attempted historically accurate costuming, but the plot draws upon popular versions of the story from Robin of Sherwood, Ivanhoe, and traditional ballads. The one innovation in Prince of Thieves is the introduction of Azim, a Muslim, bound to serve Robin Hood after he saved Azim's life in the Third Crusade. In the 19th century, there were some Muslim villains in versions of the Robin Hood tales, but a surprising innovation of the 20th century was a Muslim addition to the Merry Men. The first appearance was by a Muslim named Nasir, who was a servant of a villain defeated by Robin in the British television show Robin of Sherwood in the 1980s. He was originally intended to be a one-show character, but he was brought back due to his popularity. Nasir served as the basis for the Prince of Thieves character Azim, as well as the character Achu in Men in Tights, which spoofed the role. Similar characters have appeared in several other works. This type of character would be rare, but not impossible to imagine in 13th century Europe, when the Moors held a great deal of the Iberian Peninsula. William Shakespeare saw no problem fitting a Moorish Othello into the lead role of his great play, albeit set in the Mediterranean, not England. The addition of a Muslim indicates the extent to which the Robin stories continue to grow and morph over the passing of time. Robin continues to be adapted to new settings as well. One of the more enduring retellings has come in the form of the Green Arrow comics. The Green Arrow is an archery-based superhero set in modern-day America who was created by DC Comics in 1941 and originally had no Robin Hood connections. In the 1960s, he was rewritten as a grittier character who had lost his fortune and fought for the poor. He now dresses in green and has an Errol Flynn sequel blonde goatee. Chapter 6 the eternal attraction of Robin Hood. People continue to learn more about Robin Hood and the origins of the Robin Hood legend, but it's clear that he means different things to different people. At the heart of Robin Hood's enduring popularity with the English people is his connection to the concept of British liberty. For centuries, the English have maintained that their nation holds a special place amongst the peoples of the world as a bastion of freedom. The ideological roots of this belief lie in the idea that the original Saxon kingdoms that England was founded upon were based upon a particularly egalitarian, for the Dark Ages, view of politics. Kings were chosen, not born, and individual freemen had guaranteed rights. 
This became crystallized in the traditions of common law, trial by jury, and eventually parliamentary democracy. British liberty is more than simply a piece of national narcissism because it has had a direct impact upon British society over history. In the 18th century, early anti-slavery campaigners managed to win the freedom of all slaves in England because of an ancient belief that England was a land of free men and that the air of England is too pure for any slave to breathe, implying that people became free in England once they took a breath. Early anti-slavery campaigners like Granville Sharp were fascinated by the Saxon roots of English law and their implication on freedom. This was fundamentally different from the later French-developed Enlightenment concept of universal rights. People like Sharp viewed Saxon as fundamentally connected to the land of England or the state of being Englishmen. The American colonists presented their Declaration of Independence, which relies upon the language of universal rights, only after their earlier petitions, which were grounded in their rights as Englishmen, were denied. Robin Hood becomes a salient story when considering the oppressors of the story, King John and his minions, as foreigners. Although Richard the Lionheart is remembered as one of England's most famous kings, he was a Frenchman who spent a vast majority of his time in France. King John became the villainous embodiment of the Normans from France, who brought alien ideas of absolute monarchy with them to the islands. Robin Hood is always a Saxon, whether a commoner or nobleman, depends on the version of the story, and his retreat to the woods and struggle against the ruling classes becomes a defense of British liberty. Even Robin Hood's use of the longbow is symbolic of his role as a defender of Saxon liberty. After the battles of the Hundred Years' War, when English common-born bowmen cut down French nobles on horseback, the longbow became a symbol of doughty English freemen defending English liberty from the tyrannical French. Early modern Britain was a place where there were plenty of threats to the concept of British liberty. The Normans brought with them a new level of centralization and state, especially royal, power, which had never been seen on the islands but which were increasingly common in Western Europe. These trends only increased under the Tudor dynasty, during which Henry VIII himself brought the Catholic Church to heel in England. Dissent was common across Britain, and the right to a jury trial became one of the great bulwarks for the dissenters, leading the crown to establish the hated Star Chamber, a system of secret royal courts begun in the late 13th century where defendants had few defenses. Viewed through that prism, Robin Hood's actions become an original and successful form of dissent. Robin Hood and his dissent were legitimized by placing it within the context of the reign of King John between 1199 and 1216, a remarkably unpopular and tyrannical king whose taxation policies eventually led to the revolt of the barons, and the king being forced to sign the Magna Carta, a charter that limited his ability to control the nobility and an important document for the codification of the restrictions on royal rule and the eventual emergence of parliamentary democracy. This limitation of royal excess was supported by the nobility, who would eventually rise up against John, and therefore further justified and legitimized Robin's banditry in the eyes of the English establishment. But there is another earlier version of Robin. Before he became Robin of Loxley, a loyal but unfairly deposed noble, forced to defend the rights of free Saxon men. He was a Saxon yeoman living in the forest and raiding the rich. He was an inversion of the dominant cultural norms, defined by the nobility of the day. He lived in the forest, hunted game for his sustenance, and looted and plundered the powerful. In contrast, the manly ideal of the nobility, exemplified by Britain's other great folk hero, King Arthur, was a man who lived in a house or castles, either plowed the land and raised grain, or lived off of the labor of those who did it, and respected the laws and customs of the day, especially the rigid social hierarchy. It should be no surprise, then, that while Robin Hood was a folk hero amongst the Saxon poor, the name was very generally used to describe villains and thieves by the nobility. And naturally, King Arthur and Robin Hood 
are two different sides of the coin. It is within this cultural context that it is possible to fully understand Robin, both then and now. This is because Robin is not a set story, but an occasionally contradictory tradition, consisting of stories, songs, plays, images, films and television programs. This constellation of characters, storylines and specific acts has always floated around the themes of justice, honor, corruption, and resistance to the established norms. While societies have changed over the centuries, these themes remain relevant in shifting ways, and it should be no surprise that generations of tale-tellers have selected differently from these themes, or even added new ones. That helps ensure that the Robin Hood of the past and present will also make its way into the future and remain relevant. This has been Robin Hood, The History and Folklore of the English Legend Written by Charles River Editors Narrated by Jack Chikijian Copyright 2012 by Charles River Editors Production Copyright 2015 by Charles River Editors